to Hotel Bar Sessions, the podcast where three philosophers sit down at the end of a long conference day to chop it up at the hotel bar, which, as we all know, is where the real philosophy happens. Welcome back to the next episode of Hotel Bar Sessions. I am today's host, Charles Peterson. Today we'll be talking about reason and its place in philosophy and philosophical consideration. But before we get into that, let's get some raves and some rants and let's get some drink orders. Lee, what are you having today? Today I'm going to be having a Sam Adams Summer Ale. It's my favorite summer beer and it is definitely summer again. I am raving today about random trivia facts that you hear that are so surprising that you actually have to go look them up to make sure that they're true. (laughs) So the one I heard yesterday is Rod Sterling started the Twilight Zone because they wouldn't let him produce a teleplay about the Emmett Till murder. I did not know this. Did everybody else know this? I did not know that. I was yesterday years old when I found that out. I think you and I must have been reading the same Twitter feed and it popped up. (laughs) When I saw this, it made me remember the days when you'd be out with your friends and somebody would say something and you're like, that can't be true. And you just didn't have any way to look it up. And so, you know, you just had to either be like, you're a liar or no one will ever know. (laughs) Yeah. Unless the bar you happen to be in had a whole set of Encyclopedia Britannica. (laughs) The fact that we'd gotten to the point where we're having to do real research Research on random facts. Yeah. <laughs> There's something so weird about that, but okay, I'll go with it. Rick, what are you having and what's your rant or your rave? Well, I'm sad to say that I'm going to have a tea with lemon and honey, and that is because I have COVID. <laughs> I'm feeling much better now, but I went through some feverish nights that were not entirely pleasant. But I've turned the corner, my fever's gone. Uh, You could hear I'm still congested and incredibly fatigued. We're pulling for you, Rick. Yeah, man. Sorry to hear that. That's just shitty. No hot toddy. That's a club nobody wants to be a part of. Thank you. I blame Sweden. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, two people. Well, I'm the second person from this event I was at who have now tested positive. My friend is like, do you think the conference was a super spreader event? I said, I think Sweden was a super spreader (laughs) event. (laughs) And apropos of COVID, I am raving about the love and kindness of my family here in Poland. My sister-in-law and her husband have been looking out for me. They've been dropping off care packages. They've been making sure not only am I fed, but they're providing meals that I could easily warm up and have something hot in my stomach. They brought me a thermometer. They brought me a pulse oximeter and a couple of more COVID tests um, so that I can find out if and when I'm negative. So love to Bercha and Robert. You all have been wonderful. Good people. Yeah. God bless them. What about you, Charles? What are you drinking and what are you ranting or raving about this week? You know, I talked to Noel, who understands my need to slough off fancy pants drinks for the summer. It's 97 <laughs> here and I'm just going with the old Milwaukee. You know why? Because there's nothing special about it. It's not great, but it's got two features I like. It's cold and it's wet. So thank you, old Milwaukee, for being able to supply the basics. God bless the old lawnmower beers. That's right. Kudos to you. Exactly. My rave is the pleasures of summer reading. I've been able to create a little more time in my schedule, and I've been filling it with various book suggestions from friends. Three of those I'm going to sort of introduce you to. The first is Eli Mistal's Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. If you've seen Mistal on MSNBC or you've read him in The Nation, you know that he's a wildly charismatic, really insightful thinker with a great twist of humor. So I'm reading his book. I'm also reading Rick Moody's The Hotels of North America. It's a novel told in travel dispatches across hotels in North America. And the third book I'm reading is a nice collection of essays called The Peanuts Papers, where you have these amazing writers who are writing about their insights and thoughts about the Peanuts characters created by Charles Schultz. Ugh. It's amazing. It ranges from Gerald Early to Umberto Eco. Nice. But those are wow. the three books I've found time to read so far over the summer. I hope there's more. Echo, I'm sure, is a big Linus fan. <laughs> <laughs> 
You're right. Well, today in the hot seat is Rick Lee, and he will be leading us through a conversation on reason as such. Or can I say, since you know Kant may be involved in this, reason und sich. So, Rick, how are we approaching this? Well, th this becomes especially pertinent to me because I spent a couple of nights in that kind of feverish state where you're not sure whether you're hallucinating or you're not hallucinating, whether you're asleep or awake. And I felt like I was devoid of all reason at that point. But I started thinking about reason because it seems to be a topic that stands either at the center of or at least touches a number of other topics we have talked about already. On the one hand, we've talked about affects a lot. On the other hand, we've talked about critical thinking and the fact that you two seem to be in love with critical thinking. <laughs> I think you two went all the way with critical thinking. <laughs> and I think reason has something to do with critical thinking. And so I thought that we should just come clean and talk about what do we think about reason? What is its role in philosophy? And what is its role even outside of philosophy? Because one way we can characterize our current moment, and this is across many places in the world is that we're living in an era of irrationalism. And so it's time that we get down and talk reason. by reason. It's the Johnsonian query that I like to initiate. <laughs> right? And I hope I'm doing you proudly. You are. But what do we mean by reason? Are there higher orders of reason? Are we talking about reasonableness as known in common usage? What exactly is the foundation of our conversation? So what is most interesting about that question in the context of this discussion is that I would argue that the only way to answer that question is by deploying or using reason. Mm. In other words, the definitional question is not always and perhaps not even usually an empirical question. I think it is about what something is that would be available not to our senses, not to our affects. And so whatever it is that allows us to define things, that would also be part of reason. I like this description that one finds in Thomas Aquinas about reason, namely that it is actually a kind of defect in humans. He says, we think by discourse and the Latin word for discourse comes from the root discurere, which means to run back and forth, mm. or as I like to translate it, to run hither and thither. <laughs> <laughs> and he says that in our running back and forth, sometimes we can get off track. And so reason is what keeps us on track as we move from our knowledge of one thing to our knowledge of another thing. That's one definition of reason. Another one I think you find in many modern philosophers, Descartes, Hobbes, Spinoza, Leibniz, and that is the principle of sufficient reason. The use of the word reason there means to be able to follow, trace, and give causes. So those would be two definitions of reason. I actually like the whole idea of reason as a defect. For some reason, Thomas Dolby's blinding me with science just popped into my head, so I don't know why, but <laughs> I'm making that connection. So if we're talking about reason, we're really talking about a type of method that enables explanatory power. We can follow lines of linkages that open up one point of knowledge to understand the next point of knowledge and so on and so on. But we're really talking about what facility do we have to understand and to comprehend the object of our investigation. Yeah, and what you included in there is what I think is most crucial to all these accounts of reason, namely that it's the ability to move from something known to something else that wasn't known before, but without any further information. One way you could think about this is, what happens when I say to you, all horses are animals and all animals breathe, and immediately you're now thinking, therefore all horses breathe? What's going on in your ability to move just from those two sentences to a third one, which we vaguely say follows from it? But what is that following and what allows us to see that connection and move to the third thing? 
I really like this description. It reminds me a lot of that passage in Hegel where Hegel says, you know, if you look upon the world rationally, then the world looks rationally back. The way that you're describing reason as a kind of guardrails for our thinking in the service of making sense of the world in which we live. I think that's a really apt and a really great way to describe it, Lee. But is it necessarily a guardrail that you describe, or is it the discovering of a particular path, maybe even a, a natural path from point to point, from discovery to discovery? Well, I think in this Hegelian notion that Lee just pointed out, there is always the danger that because when I look at the world rationally, the world looks back to me as if it were rational, or it looks back to me rationally. I could mistake that for the larger claim that therefore the world is constituted as if it were constituted by a being that has reason. In other words, I take this capacity of my thinking and I make it a metaphysical reality that the world, the cosmos, the universe is itself rational. Is it your position that reason is inherent to or is reason imposed upon? Going back to this idea of the guardrail, reason as artifice is a very interesting direction to go in. But I want to hear what you think first, Rick, before I accuse you of something. <laughs> <laughs> you're only doing that because I have COVID and you're trying to be nice. <laughs> this is a question that I myself go back and forth on. The problem is inherent in reason itself. Namely, as Lee quoted Hegel saying, when I look at the world rationally, the world, I'll put it this way, the world appears rationally back to me. Then I can impute that rationality to the world itself. On the other hand, a rational outlook on the world does open up actual knowledge of the world that shouldn't be possible unless the world were actually rational. I think, though, that you don't necessarily have to impute that characteristic to the world itself. So going back a little bit, I was trying to say that reason is one way to make sense of the world. And there are, of course, other ways. And maybe it's helpful for us in this effort of trying to define reason to maybe try to define it negatively or at least to compare it to things that it's not. So one way that I can try to make sense of the world is to look upon it rationally. I could, of course, look upon it superstitiously. I could look upon it with my emotions. I could look upon it with my actual sensations. I could actually look upon it. <laughs> and those would make sense of the world in different ways than reason does. And I think in some ways, those alternatives would be deficient. There would be things that I could not know, I could not come to know, because I was using a non-rational mode of trying to make sense of the world. But I don't think in any of those instances, I necessarily have to impute to the world some inherent order or metaphysical characteristic because it's appearing to me in this way as a kind of reflection of the way that I'm making sense of. I like where we're going with this. And in my mind, as Lee was laying out her point, I want to think about reason as just one of many possible logics that function in the world. Lee laid out the various ways that one can look at a world. I want to use, personally, I want to use the word in terms of thinking about the logics of the world. And though reason opens up certain ways of understanding the world and certain processes within the world, what I also like is the fact that there are certain processes in the world that reason cannot account for, but other, what I'm calling logics, can account for. So Adorno has this text called Stars Down to Earth, which is an analysis of the astrology column in the Los Angeles <laughs> Times. <laughs> and one of my main takeaways from that book is the argument. So he doesn't say this anywhere in there exactly, but it is my upshot of the book that in a capitalist society, even the irrational has a logic. And mm -hmm. that kind of argument, Charles, I think goes to your point that something like astrology within capitalism is performing some role and function that we could trace out. But then I wonder, can't we just, as you just expanded the term logic, then I think we should also expand the term reason and rationality. There is a reason for the astrology column in the Los Angeles Times that I think we can't uncover what that function is, as Lee was saying, 
either by viewing the world aesthetically or affectively or religiously. religiously. We need this capacity that now, okay, expanded in how we're defining it, would allow us to uncover something like the function of NFTs in a capitalist society. <laughs> but I think that when we're looking for the logics in any of those things, what we're doing is rationalizing, yes. making those irrational things make yes. sense in a way, have an order, have a logic. I don't think that there is a logic to those things. I think that finding the logic is a rational operation. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons why I would want to agree wholeheartedly with you on that is because it seems as if I say that those things are rational, then I must also say, and therefore they've been developed on purpose to fulfill that reason. Whereas if I say, look, I can bring these to intelligibility and I can bring them to intelligibility by rationality, but that doesn't mean they were developed in the same way that I discover them. So I don't need an argument by design in order to analyze and understand, for example, capitalism. Yeah, and it works in the reverse as well. I mean, I might want to resist saying that there's a logic to our superstitions in the same way that I would want to say there's not a smell to mathematics. <laughs> Your math stinks. <laughs> but that could just be a <laughs> limit to one's ability to perceive these things. And this definitely sounds like a conversation we had a few seasons ago around superstitions, thinking about the rationalizations that people engage in. Well, and this is why many Enlightenment philosophers would claim that superstition arises the moment that we can't determine what the causes of any given thing are. Once we can't determine the causes, then all sorts of possible, I, I don't want to say explanations, I don't want to say accounts, but approaches to the phenomena emerge simply because we're unable or unwilling to trace the causes of something. Why not use the word accounts? So this is the nerdy historian of philosophy. That's what I'm coming for. Me. That's what I'm here for. Bring it. I spent a period of time reading, I think, pretty much the complete works of Hobbes. And somewhere in that reading, I read him saying that there is a difference between the Greek word logos and the Latin term ratio, both of which are frequently translated as reason in English. They both can be also translated as account. But the Greek word plays in the word field of language. So it could mean definition, it could mean concept, it could mean word. And so account in that sense of putting to language what something is or is about. Whereas, Hobbes argues, ratio plays in the word field of accounting. It means initially an account in that sense, like we're going to settle accounts, debits and credits and so on. But in both its Aristotelian usage and then I think through the Middle Ages and for modern philosophers, to give an account is what reason does. And so I would not like to use the word an account for something that is not deploying reason. Hey listeners, before we have too many drinks and it slips my mind, if you can't catch us at the Hotel Bar, you can catch us on Twitter at Hotel Bar Podcast. You can also follow our HBS hosts individually on Twitter to catch their off-air thoughts. You can follow Charles at at C underscore F Peterson. And Peterson is with an O, not an E. O, not an E. Rick is at at Rick Lee Philos. That's Rick Lee with two E's and Philo spelled like half of the word philosophy. And Lee is at Dr. Lee M. Johnson. The doctor's abbreviated and Lee spelled L-E-I-G-H. I wanted to look at the other side of this, and I love this term guardrail. I think that's really interesting because certainly it makes me think about what's within those guardrails, but I also now want to think about what's outside of those guardrails. And can we talk about what exactly is it that reason, let's call it scientific reason, enlightenment-based reason, as the center of our conversation? What exactly is reason sort of guarding against what's outside of those parameters? What is the unreasonable? And is there a fear of the unreasonable? Pascal has this sentence that I find one of 
of the most horrific sentences a philosopher has ever uttered. <laughs> so horrific that it has made its way into the inside of a Dove chocolate wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, the heart has reasons that even reason doesn't know. He's saying this positively, and he's developing a positive vision of affects, particularly love, against the overextension of rationality. This from the mouth of the same one who gives us a proof, not for the existence of God, but a proof to believe in the existence of God that is probably the most rational, the most coldly rational, the most calculatively rational than any philosopher has ever given. He is showing that anything that belongs to affect is on the other side of reason. So one thing is the affective is by definition non-rational. That's not to say it's irrational, but it's certainly non-rational. And again, you know, Descartes' Passions of the Soul goes through this remarkably detailed account of all the various emotions we have and what's their bodily component and what's their cognitive component and so on. And all of this is in the service of, in the end, to be able to help reason overcome emotions because they are always overcoming us. So affect is a big danger, I think, to a number of philosophers, especially those who are on the more rationalistic side. I do like the way that you began that with distinguishing between capital R reason and reasons. And this is something that I often do with my students. I'll say, you know, you can give reasons for things that you do that are not rational. And there I'm really using rational to mean logical. And I say that mostly because right. I don't want them to fall back on this idea that everyone has their own rationality, right? Yeah. Like that rationality is like an opinion or an affect or something like that. And I mean, I'm not entirely sure that I'm all the way down committed to that position, but I do think that it's essential when you're teaching intro to philosophy to impart that as if it were, yeah. you know, yeah. an inviolable <laughs> dictum for the class or whatever. But I'm curious if you think that reason is the same for all animals that have minds like ours. As you were saying that, Lee, I thought of my favorite statement about those kind of reasons that is basically opinions, and that is opinions are like buttholes. Everyone has one, and most of them stink. <laughs> yeah, so Charles asked the question before about whether each of us is – imputing a kind of metaphysical status to rationality in the world, i.e. the world is constituted in a rational order and so on. And I said that's a difficult question because I find tremendous problems in committing to that. But on the other hand, there is knowledge that reason delivers about the actual world. I'm with you, Lee, that it is important for students to understand well, I would say for people in general to understand that in order for us to speak together, to live together, especially when we have to have common projects like building bridges and fixing the railways right. and so on. Fighting pandemics. And fighting pandemics, that requires, to go back to the word we've been playing with a lot, guardrails for our thinking. And so when someone says, for example, maybe bleach could be used internally, <laughs> I think it's crucial to say your thinking is out of bounds. You've gone off the rails. <laughs> your train has seriously <laughs> derailed. Yeah. So can we talk about this question of what's within boundaries? And for all the listeners... I agree. One should not ingest any type of bleach in order to fight COVID. Bald statement. I, I know I'm going out on a limb. Well, I live in Ohio. It really is a limb. <laughs> but how do you feel about really strong life? <laughs> <laughs> Look, everybody knows that you fight COVID with thoughts and prayers. Let's just move on. <laughs> no, that's gun violence. Oh, sorry. Come on, Lee. Let's, <laughs> right. Let's get the logic straight. But in terms of the ways in which reason or certain types of reason or scientific reason is able to yield particular results from our understanding and engagement with the world. Is it one that has to be attached to the question of the ability to once understood now control or establish control over the world? 
So is reason a part of a particular complex of thinking that facilitates an empowerment of sorts over and against, let's say, early humanity's sense of threat and vulnerability to the natural world? Now that reason becomes a tool by which to reverse that relationship. And that's how we can determine the efficacy or the correctness or the proper boundaries of reason. So I want to float this as an answer. I think that the primary good of reason is to enable functional human societies, that its primary good is social. It does that by instituting guardrails, by setting rules, by saying some things are out of bounds and some things aren't. And so to get to the second part of your question, it is very much about control. And so it can go very wrong in that sense. But that is necessary for functional societies to exist and persist, for there to be control over all of these other ways that we make sense of the world, our affects, our emotions, our superstitions, our religious beliefs, imaginations, etc. I'm wondering, Charles, you mentioned two what I would call different either uses of reason or even maybe two different styles of reason. And I'm going to rely on a distinction. I don't know who the first was to make it, but it certainly comes up an awful lot in Horkheimer and also in Adorno, namely the difference between instrumental reason. So this would always be ends attached. So if you tell me you want to get to Krakow, then I can deploy my reason to find the best, cheapest, most efficient, and so on way to get there. Now, that kind of reason is unable to say, wait a second, should we? Right? And so one example I could give of this is a movie was made about the Wannsee Conference, which was the leaders of the Nazi regime, they were asked to meet in order to basically devise the final solution. You had people talking about transportation problems and supply problems and paperwork and how we're going to move all of that paperwork and, you know, keeping track and so on. And yet not a single person in that room stopped and said, hey, you know, here's a thought. Maybe we shouldn't. And there you see the distinction that Horkheimer was making and why he was so troubled about the fact that instrumental reason, particularly in capitalist societies, will shove out the other kind of reason that can talk about norms and values. And so I think that in many ways, we're pretty good in the United States. Well, no, that's that I was about to say we're pretty good at deploying our instrumental reason. But even that now has been shaken. And I think we've given up even on instrumental reason. But until recently, we were pretty good at talking about how to make businesses more efficient and so on and so forth. But we weren't ever, I think, very good at talking about what should our society look like? What does it mean to be free? Should everyone have a universal guaranteed income? Should we care for one another in terms of health? We've never been very good at using our reason to provide guardrails for that kind of discussion because we've been so used to reasoning instrumentally. But it does seem that we have been good at using our reason in the Latin sense, ratio. Credits and debits. Right, credits and debits, but not reason in the logo sense, like providing a grammar of the world, where the world is the kind of world that makes sense in the way that we believe it should. I love that phrase, grammar of the world. That's really nice. Charles, you mentioned a couple of times in the conversation what you refer to as enlightenment or scientific reason. We often just call the enlightenment the age of reason. I think we do that to like kick the Middle Ages under the bus, but be that as it may, we do call it the age of reason. And this is an age in which 
as Lee was pointing out earlier, the insistence was that we need to rely on reason precisely in order to combat superstition. That superstition is the problem, and the only solution is to advance reason and advance the project of reason. Also, though, to combat a reliance on authority, right? Because the great Mm. argument of the Enlightenment was we're all endowed with reason. We can find the truth using reason alone. We don't need to take it from an authority. Well, and I think in many thinkers, those two are connected, namely that a belief or an obedience to authority requires a lot of superstitious trappings around it. You know, like this guy has been appointed by God. And so there is in the Enlightenment, this pretty intense connection between reason and freedom. Right. So that reason is what sets us free. And I guess, in a way, the culmination of this is Kant, who simply just defines freedom as reason. Not just sets us free, but argues for the inherent freedom within all people. Mm. It's already there. So for us to move into the social political realm, it's already inherent quality to us. Am I getting that right? Yeah, but keep in mind that if we're still talking about the Enlightenment, all people is in big scare quotes there. Yeah. No, no, yeah. Oh, no, no. We're, we're getting to that. Yeah, yeah so. <laughs> we're not going to escape that. All people. <laughs> not you, ladies. <laughs> and you people uh, south of the Pyrenees, not you either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but also, in addition to that, you see these projects of a universal history, maybe starting in Kant, at least Kant is the first one I know of, that are argue that, in fact, if one is able to look at history rationally, then one sees that history, when viewed rationally, is the movement toward ever greater and increasing freedom. And so history now is caught up in this rationalist enterprise that wants to link together rationality with freedom. Before we button up this Enlightenment idea of rationality too tightly, let's also remember that Kant describes reason as always in the process of trying to exceed its own limits. Mm -hmm. I sometimes get frustrated by the cartoony version of Enlightenment reason because reason is a complex capacity, even in Kant. Right. And Kant's main worry was the metaphysical pretensions of reason. Yeah. Sure, reason might bring you to start talking about God. However, that doesn't entitle you to make metaphysical claims about the existence or non-existence of God. If I could just insert one other point here about the move in the Enlightenment to really take hold of reason, again, in the Latin sense, the ratio sense. One of the things that we've seen in turning our back on reason as, like I said before, a grammar of the world is that inheritors of the Enlightenment have always been primarily resistant to attributing rational capacities to things or people with whom they don't share a language. Animals can't be rational. Children can't be rational. Anyone from the subcontinent can't be, you know, rational, etc. We do have to keep in mind that as Derrida would say, that this conflict between speech and writing, between the kind of grammar of reason and the instrumental deployment of it has always been a problematic legacy of the Enlightenment. Well, you know, I was certainly thinking about that in terms of Sylvia Winter's discussion about reason becoming not just this particular form of contemplation or understanding, but how does it begin to define humanity itself over and against who is now considered human and what are the justifications to exert and prove one's humanity versus one's sub or inhumanity? Yeah, and the stakes of that argument post-Enlightenment are about as high as stakes can get. That's how you get rights. That's how you get protections. That's how you get personhood. Right. That's how you get the ability to speak in society and display this freedom that we're told one group of people have inherent to them, but another group of people either don't have it or now will have to prove that they can develop and cultivate that capacity. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, the philosopher Richard Sarabji years ago wrote this book about debates in late antiquity about eating animals. And it was primarily debates between pagan philosophers and Christian philosophers. Part of his argument is that Christian philosophers can't be entirely against the eating of flesh because they were committed to the fact that they were eating the flesh of Jesus every week or more often. But anyhow, Sarabji lays 
out all these various arguments on both sides, for and against eating animals. And he argues that most of them come down to whether animals have reason or not. Often that is, as you said, Lee, determined by whether animals have language or not. But Sarabji, I heard him give a paper about this book, and he said, what no one asks is whether this is not rational, therefore we should eat it, is a valid argument. (laughs) In other words, from the non-rationality of something, the killing of it doesn't necessarily follow. And none of these philosophers are arguing that position. I think a similar thing can be said about the exclusionary ways in which reason has been laid on some people and restricted from other people in order to facilitate the enslavement of people, colonizing peoples. Sure, I think there should have been a much larger discussion of this. But I think this shows, and I think, Lee, maybe this is why you were talking about the ratio sense, it shows that even the description of who is rational and who is not now becomes instrumental. Mm -hmm. There's no reason deployed in determining one human is rational and another human is not rational. I mean, this whole conversation certainly speaks to why in grad school in the 90s, there's very real hesitation about the Enlightenment project. Yeah, because of these types of contradictions and the resulting actions, policies, and histories from these contradictions. So based on that, enlightenment itself and the very idea of reason as understood within the context of the enlightenment now becomes a very dubious value from a perspective of people that do the work that I do or people who existed historically the way that I've existed. But, you know, I had a former colleague that once said in response to a paper that was given at our department It was kind of a critique of the Enlightenment project and this universality of reason. And her argument was, look, you Europeans have gone around the world telling others, you're not rational, therefore we need to take care of you. You're not rational, therefore we need to take your stuff. And so now we've worked all this distance to demonstrate our own participation in the universal human enlightenment rational project. And that's the moment now where you want to say, oh, no, that was bad. We're not doing that anymore. (laughs) We're playing a different game. (laughs) And what's the instrumentality of collapsing the game at the moment that others have started playing it pretty well? I mean, I want to say this with some hesitation, but I am really torn about arguments that I hear that are broad critiques of enlightenment reason or inheritance of enlightenment reason, because I wonder what's the alternative. So just going back to the very beginning of our conversation, we said reason is one way to make sense of the world. And there are, of course, many other ways to make sense of the world. We use reason because it allows us to make the world sensible in ways that are both instrumentally useful for us and also interesting, I think, to us. Now, if we were trees or fungi or squirrels, we would have a different way of making sense of the world. And it would be through some capacities that we human animals share, you know, sensations, instincts, affects, etc., And it might also include language, but not a language that we can understand. So the idea that there are other ways to make sense of the world other than reason as we've inherited it from the Enlightenment, yes, fine, willing to accept. The ways that reason has been deployed maliciously and sometimes in devastatingly colonialist ways and therefore should be critiqued, yes, 100%, I accept. But the deprioritization of reason, I can't accept unless you can show me something that's coming in its place. Because I'm not sure that I want to say, yes, this was a project that had a lot of problems and has caused the world to be problematic in ways that I don't like. Therefore, let's all just operate on instincts now, or let's all just operate on our emotions, or let's all just, I don't know, operate on our sense of smell and taste and touch. (laughs) That seems to me a far inferior proposition. I want to distinguish reason as a process by which we are able to understand productive, beneficial insights into the world and how it functions versus I think what I was referencing which is the North Atlantic, the European, the quote-unquote Western project of reason through the Enlightenment, 
which has the results that Lee, you just pointed out. And so, of course, yeah, we have to have some way to understand the world in order to gauge with it, better understand it. So reason as process versus the only way that we can understand and embrace reason is through this particular historical, cultural, geographical, racial, so forth and so on lens. Other civilizational units, other parts of the world, other populations can display reason and probably have the same results possibly without having the same type of repercussions that this Western European Enlightenment project has had in its use of reason. Well, I want to defend what I thought Lee was saying. And Lee, if it's not what you were saying, then I'm sorry. But first of all, to go back to the important point Lee made earlier, that Kant, who is the one who asks the question, well, he doesn't ask it, he's actually responding to an essay contest, but answers the question, what is enlightenment? He's the very one who tells us that the critique of reason is part of the project of reason itself. And so enlightenment, European, North Atlantic reason ought to have been capable of preventing the disaster, the disasters which were brought about. I don't think there's anything that necessarily follows from an Enlightenment, let's say Kantian notion of reason that leads directly to the enslavement of peoples or the colonizing of vast sections of the globe. Quite the contrary, I think there should have been an intense critique. And I think we need an awful lot of reason to figure out why reason wasn't able to provide that critique in the moment in which it was most needed. So there is a way to defend even the Enlightenment notion of reason against the ways in which the concept of reason was deployed against non-Europeans around the world. The critique of Enlightenment reason is itself a rational project, is deploying that very same Enlightenment reason in order to point out how it's been misused and misappropriated. I completely agree with that. I suppose for me, the question is really about what I hear underlying those critiques, which is to deprioritize reason. So it doesn't have to be the sine qua non of making sense of the world. And that is something that I find myself very resistant to, because what is it going to be replaced with? What's going to be the more important principle now? And I worry that the only other one that makes sense is something like belief or faith. And you could talk about how that looked in the Middle Ages, where we're really talking about religious belief, or you can talk about how that looks now, where we're often talking about opinion, opinion as if it were fact or had the same functional capabilities as rationally determined facts. And I think both of those are incredibly problematic worlds that I don't want to live in. And I think one other alternative to reason is the naked and direct application of violence. Mm. which is also a world I don't want to live in. But I think also, let's say the abuse of reason that I think we're talking about arises out of there becoming a superstitious faith in reason itself, Yeah, which yeah. is why I think the critique of reason ought to have sussed that out and prevented it. And I'm not convinced that the abuses of reason could have been detached from the historical project that we're discussing. I'm not quite convinced of that. And once again, not to say that other groups of people who have developed a particular project of engaging and understanding the world would not have had their problems, but this historical project that we're talking about is the one that we've been set in for the past 500 years, and it's the project of reason that we have to deal with. I can't say that there is a way for what has happened not to have happened under this particular way of thinking about the world that's being developed in a very specific historical moment from a very specific group of people who have their own biases, beliefs, ideas, and desires to construct the world in a certain way. Now, a fictional way of thinking about this, and it's a book I really love, is Ken Robinson Stanley's great book, Years of Rice and Years of Salt, which is this speculative world history that presumes what if the bubonic plague had completely wiped out Western Europe? And then we see the rise of particular civilizational centers, one coming out of the Arabic world and one coming out of the East Asian Chinese-based civilization. We see these key moments in world history, but that are taking place through what I would call the logics of these cultural centers. And they're using using reasons based within their historical and their cultural sensibilities. And I find it a fantastic response to Lee's question, well, what else is there? 
if we're not going to consider this particular historical project that we're talking about now. So I like that you use the word the logics there, because that's what we should critique is enlightenment logic. And I think that logic uses reason and rationality in a project of contract and domination. The problem is not reason, enlightenment reason or enlightenment rationality. The problem is enlightenment logic and the projects to which that logic was being put to use. And I'm not convinced that the so-called logic is not unrelated to the early emergence of capitalism in Europe, which then compels a logic all of its own. From that moment on, reason takes on a flavor that it didn't have prior to that. It's incredibly difficult to divorce those two from one another. Especially when it is coincidental with the rise of what we now call modern science and the resituating of human beings as the most powerful actors in the universe. Mm. Yeah, totally agree that there are so many projects that are happening at the same time. Enlightenment reason gets put into a logic of various kinds of projects, which is, I think, again, a move from logos to ratio. Yeah, I agree. What does it look like if people are actually actively throwing out the grammar of reason that has been the foundation of the way we've lived for the past four or 500 years? What does that look like? So I have a story that I think for me is illustrative. I was once at the Collegium Phenomenologicum and there was a paper by someone who does an awful lot of work on Derrida and Heidegger. At the Collegium? I'm shocked. I know. (laughs) (laughs) It was one time only. And the paper was making a big deal out of, first of all, the operatic in Derrida's thought that is not operatic in the sense of opera, but operia, and talking about Derrida's insistence on incalculability and the importance of incalculability, I think precisely in the face of this kind of calculative reason, which is often hooked up with enlightenment reason. The philosopher David Wood was in the audience, who also does a lot of work on Derrida and Heidegger, and he said, you know, everything you've said, I could imagine coming out of the mouth of George W. Bush. Hmm. Do humans have an impact on global climate? Undecidable, incalculable. (laughs) Who knows? Are there weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? Undecidable incalculable. Who knows? And he said, maybe the point we should now be making is, if something is calculable, then calculate the hell out of that. (laughs) (laughs) And only move to the incalculable when something doesn't yield to calculation. And I think David Wood was pointing out there one of the dangers in giving up wholesale on reason and rationality. If I could follow up on that, one of the things that Derrida's work over the course of his career pointed out was that all systems, as he says, auto-deconstruct, that they have excesses, that they have margins, and that they produce remainders and traces that are exactly, as you said, often undecidable, unpredictable, incalculable. And so one of the things that we ought to re-emphasize when we're critiquing the project of enlightenment reason and all of the terrible things that it has done is that there are some things that are incalculable. There are some things that are undecidable. But going back to Kant, and by the way, I think that Derrida was always a closet Kantian, but going back to Kant, we also need to recover this Kantian notion that reason is not this operation that sits in a nice box with a tightly tied bow on it, that reason is always trying to get out of that box, is always trying to Mm. do more than it actually can. In that sense, reason might not always be the best way to make sense of some things, to echo what Rick just said, but where it works, there's a reason at it. (laughs) And it seems that the earlier question about reason in terms of being able to understand and think through questions of values versus reason in terms of thinking about debts and credits, 
Because to me, when you were saying that, Lee, the momentum of reason popped into my head. And the momentum of reason is what takes you to figure out, well, how long will it take the trains to move between Auschwitz and Wuchenwald? That's where the momentum of reason will take you if you're not careful, if you don't have this logo sense of reason and think about values and the ethics of a particular reasonable or rationalized operation. Yeah, because there is a large group of people out there today who present themselves as these logical, rational, problem-solving, correctly apprehending the truth of the world as it is people who are also neo-Nazis, white supremacists, idiots. If you watch them, if you watch people like Richard Spencer, he looks like an assistant professor from, you know, the community college down the street. And he speaks like that. There is a power that that presenting your argument as rational and logical brings with it. And that is an inheritance of the Enlightenment that we really have to get rid of. We have to say that just presenting things in a way that mimics reason, mimics a logic, mimics a kind of rational approach to the world, they're not all the same. They're not all made the same. And we have to resist that. So if I might plug myself, some years ago, I wrote a book called The Force of Reason and the Logic of Force. And one of the sides of my argument was that, as Lee was just pointing out, there is inherent in reason that it itself become a force. Mm -hmm. That is, it itself becomes something like a counter-reason or anti-reason. And yet, what I wanted to also argue is that we need something like reason in order to be able to analyze, trace, and deal with the operation of force. To keep within that tension of preventing reason from slipping into a force so that we are able to use reason as a tool to help us deal with force, I think is really crucial. And therefore, the wholesale rejection of reason, I find incredibly troubling and maybe even dangerous. Yeah. And we have to recall that the end product of reason is not always the truth. Often the end product of reason is to demonstrate that something that we thought to be true wasn't true and we don't know what the truth is or to open up new questions that weren't being asked. I love in mathematics that people have made whole careers on taking something that is known. For example, pi has infinite digits, like everyone knows that. But then the demonstration that that is the case can make someone's career and they spend a lifetime (laughs) just on these kinds of proofs of known fact. I love that. I think there is another danger, and that is that we in philosophy, I think, often feel like all questions, even questions of fact, can be settled a priori. Yeah. (laughs) And I think we need to get over that. Hey, we couldn't hear you while you were shouting into your headphones. So if you have feedback or suggestions for future topics, or if you just want to pick a fight with one of our co-hosts, or in fact all of us, just visit us at www.hotelbarpodcast.com and click on the interactive page. If you want to belly up to the bar with us, at least virtually, you can always email to hotelbarpodcast at gmail.com. If it's interesting, we're going to steal it from you. If it's not, we'll send you our Venmo handles and you can virtually buy us a drink. All right, Rick, it looks like Noel is reasonably assuming it's time for us to go. I want to critique that. (laughs) (laughs) That's not rational. (laughs) No, that's not rational. Do you have any final thoughts for us and the listeners? Well, first of all, I didn't hear that because Noel wouldn't let me sit close to the bar. (laughs) So from across the room, I didn't hear. Actually, this conversation did not go in the way I expected it to go and in a way that I really enjoyed. I have some new things I need to think about, and I do appreciate appreciate this point that we got to, or at least Lee and I, maybe Charles, you didn't come all the way, I don't know, about the sort of autoimmunity of rationality 
is not a reason for <laughs> killing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I'm there, but that's what afterthought sessions are all about. <laughs> and speaking of afterthoughts, I invite the listeners to join us on patreon.com backslash hotel bar sessions and support us at any level that you're most comfortable with. Yeah, and you can see our afterthoughts this season as exclusive content on Patreon. So definitely sign up and kick a few dollars back to this podcast. I suppose it's my turn to call a cab, but Charles, just between me and you, I don't really want to sit in a cab with Rick and it's COVID. So. <laughs> I'll call two cabs. Okay, I'll call great. two cabs. <laughs> totally reasonable. <laughs> I love you anyhow. <laughs> All right, everybody. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.